Okay, as you can see from our agenda, we're going to do a quick review of series parallel, which is what we were talking about last week. And then we're going to do source conversions, mesh analysis, seven and theorem, and max power transfer. Okay. Here's a lab that I normally do with the students on series parallel. Uh, so let's just work through this. We can work together on it. So get your mic on, and if you've got a calculator, you can do a little quick calculation here. Uh, first thing we want to do is find our total resistance. So to do that, we're going to start the furthest from the supply. We, and I'm going to start off by doing a little bit of rounding here, since uh, we're, just, we're not after exact answers tonight anyway. Uh, that 470, I'm going to say that's pretty close to 500 ohms, which would be a half a K. 4.7K, that's pretty close to 5K, so I'm just going to write that to 5K. And 100 ohms would be 0.1K. Now we got everything in K ohms. And if we take 10K is in series with 0.5K. So that means I've got 10.5K right here. And that's in parallel with what we're calling 5K. If I do product over sum, that's 10.5 times 5 divided by 10.5 plus 5. I come up with about 3.4K for resistance of all of this out here. And then to find the total resistance, we're going to add the 1K, which is in series, and the 0.1K. And that gives me a total of 4.5K ohm for the entire circuit. Now, same circuit down here, we're going to apply our 18 volts. And when we apply 18 volts, uh, let's find our current, our total or source current, would be my 18 volts divided by the 4.5K, and I come up with about 4 million. Now, if we've got 4 milliamps, what we want to do is we want to find the current around this loop and around the loop out here. So we're going to use that current divider rule like we did before. And we're going to look at this junction right here, the very first junction there. Remember the current divider rule, if we are looking for I2, then we will put the resistance that's shown back in this direction on top, divided by that resistance plus this one, and then multiplied by the current coming into the junction. And my current coming into the junction is 4 million. You have 5K this direction, 10.5K this direction. So 10.5K divided by 10.5K plus 5K multiplied by the 4 milliamps coming in gives me 2.7 milliamps going down through R2. And then the current going out this direction through R3 and R4 would be the 4 milliamps minus that 2.7, which would be about 1.3 milliamps. Now back over here, I have that 1.3 milliamps plus the 2.7, which gives me back the 4 milliamps that you started with around the loop. Now I can look at my individual voltage drop, and we're going to do some comparison there. If I look at V1, voltage is equal to the current times resistance, so it would be 4 milliamps times 1K, or 4 volts. Down here to V5, 4 milliamps times 0.1K gives me 0.4 volts. Now, let's look at R2. What did we say the current through R2 was? That's after it split here, and at that point, we said we had 2.7 volts, or excuse me, milliamps. 
2.7 million amps times 5K gives me 13.5 volts. Now, the current that was going out in this direction, we said was 1.3 million amps. So for V3, we would have 1.3 million amps times 10K, or 13 volts. And here we've got 1.3 million amps times 0.5K, which is about 0.65 volts. Now, if I add the voltage here and here, V3 plus V4 should equal V2, because those together are in parallel. Well, here we said we had 13 and a half. Here we come up with 13.65. But remember, we did quite a bit of rounding as we went along. So that's why there's a discrepancy there. And if we take V1 plus V2 plus V5, we should end up with what we started with at 18 volts. Well, I've got 4 volts and 0.4 volts, and then 13.5 volts, which gives me 17.9 or roughly 18 volts, again, accounting for some rounding along the way. And what I have students do in a lab, I have them do all the calculations first, and in a lab situation, I actually allow them to do the rounding like I did because that's going to give them a very close approximation of what they should be reading. Then they're going to hook it up and actually read all of the different voltage levels, all of the currents, and uh, verify that that uh, is the correct calculation. Any, any questions on how we go about that one? And this is the type of circuit that I would think most of you would have enough equipment in your lab. You could hook it up. Uh, these are all standard value resistors. Without any, we don't do the rounding. 18-volt uh, power supply. And then we should need a multimeter to be measured. Hey, Ken, this is Mark Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, so, but obviously this wouldn't be the first time you, you would introduce a, a lab. You'd have labs right. I have all labs throughout, for every right? Topic, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, but this is a typical, this yeah, is a typical lab. You have them do the, the work mm -hmm. and, and do all the math outside and then check everything right. in a real setting. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is the lab that I do with the series parallel. Uh, we mm -hmm. would, would have already completed one with uh, reading the resistor color code. We've done one with series circuits and with parallel circuits, and now up to the series parallel. And I have them work in groups of about 40, no more than 40, ideally two, depending on what our uh, enrollments are. Mm -hmm. That way, everybody's sharing in the work. And I try to keep an eye on each group to make sure that uh, we don't have one person doing all the work and the other one is sitting there. Working. And do you just have them plug resistors into breadboards, or or what? Uh, how do you? What's your physical setup typically? Okay, what we start off with is actual discrete components, and I have uh, little short pieces of wire with alligator tips on each end. But they're actually mm -hmm. putting it together, you know, the old fashioned breadboarding of a circuit. And then uh, from there, I advance up to the proto boards. Uh, this one would probably be the last lab that I do with uh, uh, the alligator clip uh, wire connections, and then we move up to the proto board and actually plug into a proto board. Okay, that just gives me a perspective. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, now let's start with our new material. And we're looking at source conversion. Something that we have to make sure that a student understands is this circuit we're talking about what is inside this box, if you will, this power supply that's there on the bench, okay? 
mean you've got a low volt source. There is some internal resistance. And here's the two connections. That's the terminals, the output of your supply. Now, if it is a voltage source, we can analytically convert it to a current source or vice versa. In a voltage source, you have the voltage source and some internal resistance that would be in series with that voltage source. If it is a current source, it has the same internal resistance, but it is in parallel with the current source. And here would be our external terminal. And what I actually do uh, when I present this on the board, I actually put a dashed box around here so that they realize that's what's inside the box. And this is what's inside the box. Here's the terminal where we connect to it. If I'm given a 12 volt source, and I know my internal source resistance is 6 ohms, then if I want to analytically convert that to a current source, just draw it as a current, current source, add your 6 ohm internal resistance in parallel, and then use Ohm's law to determine what this current would be. I is equal to V over R, 12 volts divided by 6 ohms, 2 amps. Okay, now let's suppose that we were given this and we want to convert it over to the voltage source. So if we were given a 2 amp source with 6 ohms internal resistance, we would draw it just as the 12 volts and with the source resistance in series. Uh, draw again, V is equal to I times R, 2 amps times 6 ohms, 12 volts. You see, we can go back and forth analytically. Going one to the other. And okay, now I got a couple more examples here. Here we've got a voltage source to start with, and we're going to convert it to the current source. 18 volts, 6 ohm source resistance. Draw a current source, put the 6 ohms in parallel with it. 18 volts divided by 6 ohms, 3 amps. And here's another one. Now we're going to start with a 1.5 amp current source, 3 ohm internal resistance, which obviously is in parallel. Convert that to a voltage source. There's the voltage source. That internal 3 ohm resistance is now in series with it. Ohm's law, 1.5 amps times 3 ohms, 4.5 volts. I think we have here, 4.5 volts. Now, we're going to use this when we get up into mesh analysis. But this is a way that we can analytically convert our sources either to all current sources or all voltage sources. Okay? Questions on that? Hey, Ken, I'm... I'm hmm. I guess, I guess my question is I... I I don't know what the difference is between a voltage source and a current source. I would I would think like a battery as an example, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, isn't it isn't it both? Or, or what am I missing? Well, if you are taking a power supply that you plug into the wall, mm -hmm. most power supplies would be a voltage source, but we also have sure. a box that is considered a current source as well. Okay. okay. And all we're doing is, is converting this analytically on paper because I'm going to be talking about mesh analysis, mm -hmm. uh, which uses all uh, voltage sources. We could use nodal analysis, which uses all current sources. So whichever one you have, you have to use it, convert one way or the other. Okay. That, this is just an analytical tool. Sure. I guess I've just never I've never run into a current source then or or I'm not I'm not sure if I've run into a current source okay. anywhere in my in my robotics background. Mm-hmm. 
So okay, so so that's what what you're saying. It's analytically used for for when we do mesh analysis. So right, right. Stay stay tuned. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Now let's go to mesh analysis. Now, in your textbooks, uh, I'm sure you whatever textbooks you're using, it it will have mesh analysis. Probably has nodal as well. But whenever you read the section on mesh analysis, it's several pages long. And I've tried to condense this down. This is my Reader's Digest condensed version here. And I just put it into some simple steps. Convert current sources to voltage sources. Everything has to be a voltage source analytically on our uh, circuit that we're going to draw. So whatever is necessary to do that. Assign loop currents. The direction is arbitrary. Now, I'm going to advance up this one slide here. Okay, this is what we're talking about by mesh analysis. Okay, you've got a voltage source over here. You've got one over here. I see a current loop here. I see a current loop over here. I've got a common element with this current as well as this one. It's traveling through. It can make my two loops. That's a two by two mesh analysis loop. So that's the type of circuit we're looking at uh, analyzing. So let's go back up here. Assign the loop currents the directions arbitrary. Well, if I go down here, I can make them go the way I've got them. I could have them going the other way. I could have one going one way and one the other. Doesn't matter. Any way you want to do it. Because we're going to make up a, a mathematical expression as we go around the loop. Now, here's a little hint that I tell students, just trust me, I've been doing this for a while, that if I have the current going through this direction, the same as the one going through on this side. In other words, both currents going through the common element in the same direction, I will have less negative numbers to deal with in my math expressions. And if you're like I am, I would just assume not have any negative numbers to deal with. Okay, that's just a little hint there. Okay. Polarize the sources. Well, typically, if it's a voltage source, the polarity is already going to be uh, given anyway. Arbitrarily assign a polarity to any resistor anywhere in the network, but assign to only one resistor. Students really get hung up on this because they say, but resistors don't have a polarity. I know that. But just give it one because we're just doing this on paper. Okay, so I pick a resistor and I say, okay. I'm going to say that that's the positive side and that's the negative side. So then we've got to determine which way is the current going through that resistor. It's going plus to minus. Okay. Now we assign all the remaining resistors the same way. So this current has to go through here, plus to minus. Up here, plus to minus, and plus to minus. Again, so far, this is all on paper. We're not hooking this up. It's just on paper. So we can come up with a solution. Okay, check to see which direction the assigned loop current goes through the polarized resistor. It's either plus or minus or minus plus, but it obviously can't be both. After that determination, the direction is determined, then assign the remaining resistor polarity so that they agree with the initial assignment. Now, use K's voltage law to write the loop equation. That's not Tim's law, this is Kirchhoff's law. Remember Kirchhoff's voltage law around a series loop. That the algebraic sum of the potential rises and the potential drops or falls, whichever way you want to say it, uh, is equal to zero around the closed loop. Then we're going to set it up into the to determinants and solve, and good luck. Number nine being the most important uh, step involved. Okay. Now, looking at this loop equation, let's write our expression. I'm going to start right here where that dot is. That just reminds me of where I started. I'm going to go around this loop. 
Okay, this is V1 is equal to 4 volts. So that's plus 4 volts. Now, this would be a voltage drop. Right? I don't know what the voltage is, but think about Ohm's law. Ohm's law says the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. So it would be minus 4 ohm times I1. All right, I'll look here, minus 8 times I1. Then minus the shared current of 8 times IT. And then we're back to here, so we'll set that up to 0. Then on the other side, I have plus 6 volts. Okay, minus 2 ohms times I2, minus 8 ohms times I2, minus the shared current of 8 ohms times I1. That's all the way around the loop. You set that up to be 0. Now, I remind the students from their math classes that they had it. That they probably run across an expression, and I'm just like this on the board 4x plus 3y equals 7, and it's 7x plus 1y equals 9, and you solve for x and y. And most of them will say, Yeah, I remember doing that math. And most of the time they'll comment, Didn't know where I'd ever use it. Well, here's your chance. Instead of x and y, we're using i1 and i2. Okay. So, I'm going to make I1 column here and an I2 column, and here's the uh, answer to the question. Okay, so let's get up all the I1s, and I count up. I've got uh, negative 12 I1 minus 8 I2 equals negative 4, because when I bring this to the other side, it becomes a negative. And then down here, I've got how many I1? Negative 8 I1 minus how many I2s? Okay, minus 10 I2 equals negative 6. There's my expression. Now I told you earlier that if we had the current going through the common element in the same direction, we'd have left negative numbers. Now, we're going to fix that. Everything is negative at this point. So I'm going to simply multiply by negative 1, and that makes everything a positive. So I've got 12i1 plus 8i2 equals 4, and 8i1 plus 10i2 equals 6. So with that, I'm now ready to set this up in my determinants and solve for I1 and I2. Okay, everybody with me to this point? Questions up to this point? Yes, sir. Everybody okay? Okay, now, and the determinant. Okay, we're looking for I1. Yeah, here's your I1 column, and here's your I2 column, and this is what I refer to as the center. Okay, the bottom of your determinant, the fraction will put it together. You see, I just bring down the I1 column. I've got 12 over 8. In the I2 column, I bring down 8 over 10. Now, if I'm solving for I1, with this solution right here, in the I1 column, 4 and 6, bring down the I2 column, 8 and 10. Now, to do determinants, it's down and to the right multiplied together, and then minus down to the left multiplied together. So 4 times 10 minus 8 times 6. And on the bottom, we've got 12 times 10. Minus 8 times 8. Now 4 tens is 40, minus 48, over 120, minus 64. That's 
minus 8 over 56, which is minus 1 seventh, and it would be amp because we have volts and ohm. If everything was in K ohm, then it would be boom. Okay, so that is a minus 1 seventh of an amp. Yeah. Is going to jump up and down. Wait, wait a minute. What's what's a minus or a negative amp? What is that? All that is saying is that I one right here instead of going that direction, in reality, it's going the other way. It's just a matter of direction because when we chose, we chose them arbitrarily. So that's saying this one's really going the opposite direction. It's still one seventh of an amp. Okay, now let's solve for I2. I2, we've got okay, here's your I1 column and your I2 column doesn't change in the bottom part of the fraction. Now the top part of the fraction, we are solving for I2, so the solution here goes into I2 column. Bring down your I1 column, which is that 12 and the 8. 12 times 6 minus 4 times 8. That's 22 minus 32 is 40. The bottom is the same as it was before. 120 minus 64 is 56. Now we've got 40 over 56, which is 5 sevenths of an amp. Okay, now that is going the direction that we arbitrarily assigned it before. So I have I've got five sevenths of an amp going this way and I've got one seventh of an amp going that way. Now what is the current through R3? The current for R3 would be five sevenths plus a negative one seventh or four sevenths of an amp flowing in the direction of this five sevenths. So it would be four sevenths of an amp going in this direction. All right, questions. On this one. Hey Ken, I, I was thinking about earlier about current sources and voltage sources and th things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. part of the issue, I guess, is that you know there there really are no ideal voltage sources or ideal current sources. That is perfect systems. I mean, right. a power supply as we know it. You know, if you if you connect a power supply and you and the system you connect it to draws too much current from that supply. The terminal voltage will drop off, right? And you know, and quite frankly, I mean, so we 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 sort of go in with the assumption that our source, whether it's a battery or a power supply in the lab or whatever the case might be, is is designated to be 12 volts or something like that. But that that's going to be 12 volts depending on the load it's connected to, right? And, and I think the same holds true for the the purpose of a current source is just to be able to differentiate uh, the whole notion of voltage and current and in looking at a circuit design or a circuit analysis problem or, you know, again, we're, we're thinking about this in the context of somebody, you know, doing engineering type work, technology type work, um, and they've got to understand that if I load down a source, uh, it's going to, you know, number one, it's going to cause damage to that source. Number two, you're not going to get the terminal voltage, which could, in fact, be the problem in the circuit. Right. And that's uh, why if we look at a, a, a voltage source, for example, a, a power supply, it will be rated, uh, at, say, 12 volts up to so many amps or milliamps, whatever the rating is. And if you exceed that current draw, then the voltage is going to start dropping off. Yeah. And, and 
And we know that the re- I mean, the reason it does that is because there's an internal resistance. There has to be because there's internal conductivity of current. So there's right. got to be resistance. And when that happens, draw too much current. Um, so so basically, that's what happens. You end up getting um, getting uh, you know a, a reduction in the terminal voltage. So mm-hmm. stuff. Just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Okay. I appreciate those comments. That I, I'm, I'm starting to see why. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, n- not my background, so, I, so I'm, I'm seeing some of the pieces, some of the, some of the light bulbs are coming on why, why we're doing this. I appreciate it, guys. Good. Hey, anybody else? Over 596. That's 
1.92 milliamps. And if I'm looking for the current through R2, that is the combination of the two currents. In this case, both of them come up as positive numbers, which means that the direction that we arbitrarily chose a while ago is correct. So I2 is equal to I1 plus I2. So 1.31 plus 1.92, 3.23 million. Now, once you get in the loop equations, then there's other methods mathematically to solve this. So you could do the substitution method and whatever else you want to do, but this is a method I learned 40 some years ago and it's the one I use. Okay, question time for the end. You're awfully quiet out there. Hey, hey Ken, I do have a question. Uh huh. So, so as um, well, how to how to even how to even ask? I guess I guess are there my, some of my students are going to ask this question, and and I'm not sure how to answer it. And uh, what about simulators? Is there something? Nowadays, with with as much computer technology as there is, and Excel spreadsheets and, and all, all that stuff, are there tools that do this for you? And I'm, I I know the dangers of that mm -hmm. too, but but I'm wondering, you know, some of some of them are asking that, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of asking it myself. I guess I. I understand the, the necessity of, of doing the math, but mm -hmm. is there are there are those are those kind of computer tools out there nowadays? Yes, they are. Uh, okay. Electronic workbench is one of them. Uh, Spice is another one. Uh, I mean, you can draw out your circuit, put in your values, and then ask for it to solve for I. Mm -hmm. uh, to, and it'll go through and solve it for you. Uh, however, most of the time it just gives you an answer. It doesn't show you how mm -hmm. it did. And uh, at this point in a DC course, we are more concerned that they understand how to do it. Mm -hmm. This is the foundation course. Now, granted, later on, if they're doing this and they're going to be doing you know, several circuits like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. you'd be using a tool to to uh, to do that with. But having oh, yeah. a good understanding of it is is vital. Certainly. Certainly, I'm I'm just wondering as as circuits get more and more complicated, mm -hmm. the the chance of doing something wrong with your math, right? Uh, yeah, it, it, it grows exponentially. Oh yeah. So yeah. having some way, uh, well, and uh, hmm. I'm I'm not sure how you you stop students from using those tools too for for, for something like this. Um, but well, uh, yeah, here, here, I mean, you, you make them use pen and paper for everything. But yeah, in fact, uh, this next slide, uh, you know, it says 35 points there, and. Uh, mm -hmm. Number three, much talent to determine problem. That's actually one problem off of a mm -hmm. that that's Sure. Problem number three. And they have to show me all of their work on how they're doing that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, and that that un makes makes you understand very well if they if they have the mathematical foundation to understand this stuff and if they have a comprehension right. of what's going on. So I I like that. I'm just I typically do a lot of open internet mm -hmm. tests because I say use the tools. You know, there's so many tools out there now. But for something like this I you know 
I'm, I'm scared. To, I'm. It's almost like I have to restrict that. Otherwise, I'm. I mean, even something, even something this complicated. This isn't particularly complicated when when you think of circuit. Mm-hmm. But now, now you you fill in values and you get an answer, and that's. I mean, that doesn't show the work. Obviously, that's. I know. Um, I'm torn. <laughs> software called Tina that um, used in Miami, it's really inexpensive, capable. If you do a search, I think you'll find it. Again, I'm not that familiar with it, but I know faculty have used it in the past just because it's so inexpensive. What's it called again, Rob? Just called Tina. Okay. Tina. Okay. I think it's up. I think if you just do a search on it, it'll pop up. And Can then, do. Also, software like MATLAB now, you know, it takes a little training, and, and you know, I personally mm-hmm. have not used, but it'll do, you know, these matrices that he's got, you know, the determinants mm-hmm. that he's got here. I mean, you just put the numbers in, equations, and it'll solve the determinants for you. Maybe, you know, it may be a useful learning tool to use tools like that at the same time. You know, maybe between going back and forth trying to show the students how mathematically mm-hmm. it's set up, they can maybe solve it manually. And, you know, if they get portions of it, it's there's value in it. I mean, these are I – th- I think these little steps right here can be tough for even college students, too. I mean, it's – Oh, sure. Sure, you know, and, and and as I'm looking at this, I'm I'm, I'm saying, okay, I have, to, I have to refresh myself on how to how to do some of this stuff if I, if I want to help my students figure this out. I mean, I'm I'm 20 years away from doing equations like this. Sure. Right. From, from yeah, yeah, exactly. From my college uh, days. Say, hey, let's. Uh, you know, if I if I show you, you know, this is an equation that solves this circuit. Can you use that in your problem solutions? You know, mm-hmm. and in strategies. And I'm with you though. It's tough. I mean, um, getting students to connect the math to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I mean, Ken said it. You said it very early on. This is this is an opportunity to to hey, all that math that you're doing, you have a you have an actual application. A lot of students struggle to to understand why they're doing math. Mm-hmm. If they if they they can connect to why they're doing it, it makes it makes a lot more sense to them. They 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 do they do a lot better. It's just like in, in AC, for example, which would be the second course they would take following the DC course. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we get into phaser analysis and they have to convert from polar to rectangular format and, and vice versa, what I always mm-hmm. do on their first exam where that uh, we're covering that topic, I will have one problem and they have to do it manually, show me all their steps of how they convert from one to the other. Mm-hmm. They show me one time they know how to do it. From then on, most calculators anymore, you put it in one format, you push a button, and it gives it to you automatically in the other format. And I let them use that tool. Mm-hmm. But they do have to prove that they do know how to do it, just like mesh analysis. You know, one, one problem on the exam, and you know they have to show me all the steps that they know how to do it. But after that, you know, whatever tools that they have available is fine. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I think I think that can work for me. Gentlemen, I apologize. I, I'm I'm double booked uh on Tuesdays with my licensure class here at Wright State. So I, I actually have to get going. Okay. But uh I very much appreciate all you're doing here and, and getting the recordings has been excellent, very useful. Okay. So hey, m- Mark's got to leave, but I wanted to bounce off. Mark and I have connected outside this, too, and I think the others and I have as well. We want your feedback. If there's something that you want and to back up on to change the way, maybe work problems, or I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Don't hesitate to send an email, make a verbal comment, whatever works for you. Because we're trying to make this work. You're going to have yeah, no, th- thanks, thanks, Rob, for that. And, and again, this is this has been great. This is, you know, I don't I don't expect you to teach me everything about electronics either. You know, I, a lot of this is stuff I have to come come to. Um, sure. But no, this is this has been great. So, 
I appreciate it, guys. All right, see you, Mark. Yep, take care. Okay. I'm going back to mute, Ken. Okay. Hey, anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, let's take a look at this. Uh, this will be our last uh, seven-minute problem. Or, excuse me, our last March analysis problem. Then we'll get into seven. And like I said earlier, this is actually one from an exam. And I have the students uh, look through this and show me that uh, they do know how to do this. They have to line it all up and uh, fill all the steps. Then after that, if there is a tool that they have available, then they're more than welcome to use that. So we've got it set up with our loop uh, current, as we've got drawn here. Um, the voltage. Okay, this voltage right here over on the uh, left hand side, they've got chopped off is actually 20 volts. This is 20 volts. I think everything else we can read. So looking for I1, uh, this first loop, and then we'll look at I2 loop. Okay, we've got plus 20 volts, plus 20 V1, minus 1K times I1, and again, Everything's in K, so I'm not going to write the Ks, and I just know that my current will be a million amps at the end. So I've got 20 volts minus 1I1 minus 2I1 minus 3I1 minus the shared current of 2I2 minus the shared current of 3I2. And then minus 10 I1 is equal to zero. That's everything around that loop. Now let's go to the other side. Here I've got plus 40, that would be D2, minus 4 I2, minus 6 I2, minus 2 I2 minus 3i2, minus the shared current of 2i1, minus 3i1, going back to here, minus 5i2, and set that up to be zero all the way around the loop. Now we have to gather up our like terms and get all the i1s and i2s gathered up. So I had, originally I had minus 16 I1 minus 5 I2 equals minus 20. Minus 5 I1 minus 20 I2 equals minus 40. Multiply everything by negative 1, that changes all to positive. And then set up my determinants and solve. I1, but solving for I1, the solution here is I1 column on the top, 20 over 40. Your I2 column, 5 over 20. Now on the bottom, it's just the I1 column, the I2 column. So 16 over 5, 5 over 20. Down to the right, minus down to the left. 20 times 20 is 400, minus 5 times 40, that's 200. And on the bottom, 16 times 20 is 320. Minus 5 times 5 is 25, 200 over 295, 0. 0.678, and again, there will be millions. For I2, the bottom remains the same. On the top, we put the solution or the answer here in the I2 column, bring down the I1 column right here. So we have down to the right, 640 minus down to the left of 100 over, again, the bottom is the same, 320 minus 25. That's 540 over 295, 1.83 milliamps. And then if we 
that are solving for the current through R5, that's this one right here. So that is the algebraic sum of the two. They're both positive in this case. So that would be 0 0.678 milliamp plus 1.83 gives me about 2.51 milliamp. Okay, questions. Okay, next topic, Thevenin's theorem. Okay, and we'll just start off with the circuit here. We have what I refer to as a driver circuit and a load connected to it. And all of this is represented as a series parallel type network. What Thevenin's theorem will do is it will take this driver circuit and convert it analytically to a simple series circuit. We can put our load back on and now we're solving a simple series loop. So this is just a tool analytically to use. Okay. My little short description of how to do this. Again, if you look in the textbook, you're going to be looking at several pages. And I have did the Reader's Digest condensed version of it. Isolate the element or elements to be studied. This creates an open circuit. Determine the open circuit voltage. Short voltage sources and open current sources, and then determine the open circuit resistance. All right, here you have to stress with students. This is analytically on paper. Do not ever short the voltage source literally in the lab. You have to stress that. This is an analytical tool on paper. Okay? Then draw the seven and equivalent circuit. Replace the isolated element or elements and continue the analysis to completion. Now, maximum power transfer theorem also states that in order for maximum power to be delivered to the load, then that load resistance must be equal to the Thevenin equivalent resistance. Now, so that students can visualize what we're talking about. Most of them have worked with uh, sound systems in, in some form or another where they've got speakers and they're going to couple it up to an amp. And they talk about, of course, we're dealing with AC instead of DC, so we're talking about impedance instead of resistance, but you have to match the impedance of the speaker to the impedance of the amplifier. The amplifier is that driver circuit. In order to get maximum power, delivered out here to my speaker, it has to have the same impedance as the amplifier does. So that way they can relate to what we're really trying to do here. Okay, so in order for maximum power to be delivered to the load, then that load resistance has to equal the Thevenin equivalent resistance. How much will that maximum power be? The maximum power to the load is equal to the Thevenin equivalent voltage squared divided by four times the Thevenin resistance. Okay, so now if we take these little steps here and apply them to this circuit, and as you can see, this happens to be uh, one of the problems on an exam. Okay, let's work through this. Uh, we're first going to isolate the element. So right here, we're going to isolate this. This becomes an open. Okay, so that's an open. That's it. Determine the open circuit voltage. What I want to know is if I would hang a voltmeter here and here. This is no longer there. I just look from this point to this point with a voltmeter. I would actually be reading the voltage across R3. Everybody see that? Okay, so looking at this circuit, I've got a 100 volt source, 
I've got 10 k out here, but look what we've got here. It's a simple series loop, right? So the voltage here would be 100 volts minus whatever drop across we go to Well, let's look at the value. You've got 2 k plus 5 k plus 3 k. Well, that's 10 k. So there's 10 k there and 10 k here. So that means half the voltage is up here, the other half is up across the screen together. So I've got a simple voltage divider. So my open circuit voltage right here, in this case, would be half of the 100 or 50 volts. So I'm going to draw my equivalent circuit up here, and there's my 7 voltage of 50 volts. Okay, now the next step says short voltage sources open current sources and then determine the open circuit resistance. So we're going to short this out. In other words, that becomes a piece of wire. It's no longer a power supply. It's a piece of wire right there. Now, with respect of this open circuit, which is here to here, with respect here to here, what is my total resistance? That's the sediment equivalent resistance. So if I look at this point, that resistor, that one, down through that short, of that one, R2, R1, and R4 are in series, and those three in series are in parallel with R3. So R2 is 5K plus R1 is 2K plus R4 is 3K is in parallel with R3, which is 10K. Well, this is also 10K. So I've got 10K in parallel with 10K. That would be 5K. So my total resistance with respect to right here would be 5K ohms. So go back to this 7 and the equivalent circuit. This is the 7 and equivalent circuit of all of this. And then I'm going to reconnect RL. Okay. Now, the question is, the value of RL in order for it to receive maximum power? Well, according to the maximum power transfer theorem, in order for it to receive maximum power, the load resistance has to be equal to the 7 and equivalent resistance, which we just found to be 5K ohm. Now, if it is 5K ohms, if we put a 5K ohm load on this driver circuit, then what would be my maximum power? Well, max power is the 7 and equivalent voltage squared divided by 4 times RTA. 7 and equivalent voltage is 50 squared, that's 2500, divided by 4 times 5K, that's 20K. That'd be 125 and be milliwatts since we're dividing by K ohm. All right, question time. Nobody's got a question. I, um, I know, Ken, when this, that maximum power transfer idea is just such a powerful idea in terms of its, its meaning and certainly has relevance, as you said, to the audio systems. And um, it's just a good tool. Well, once I get students convinced that, that it is useful and, and I point out the audio system, like I say, they're usually pretty uh, uh, susceptible in receiving that because they're somewhat familiar with audio systems. And then, uh, you know, when we think of an amplifier, uh, a lot of people think of automatically that it has to be an audio amplifier. But if you're into the automatic control uh, systems, and, uh, to us in that arena, an amplifier is not necessarily audio. It's just a signal. And we have to amplify that signal. That's why we have all the various different op-amp circuits, so that we can amplify and uh, we can shape our output waveform and modify it and uh, 
so then we can do comparisons with it and so forth. And uh, uh, but we always have an amplifier driving a load, and this uh, this tool is probably one of the handiest tools around in order to determine well, you know, what what uh, impedance or what resistance of load do I need to get maximum power, and then how much. What's the maximum power I can get out of it? Yeah. Can you, you uh, in one of your previous pages there, there was a formula about what that power is, mm -hmm. I, I think. Yeah, yeah right, right there. Right. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not sure. What, um, how is that, how does that come about? Do you, I mean, do you know right off if, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Um, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember just how to derive it. It's, uh, I know it's that's one of the reasons we we thevenize the circuit is in order to apply maximum power transfer sure. uh, to it. And if we take the seven and equivalent voltage and square it, and then divide it by four times the seven and resistance, I mean it's a very short, straightforward uh, equation, and yeah. that was the amount of that maximum power. And uh, I know it's this come from oh. the uh, Boylstead text. I didn't yeah. remember that. Actually, but I, I, I guess I'm, it, could be, it could be the RL in parallel with RTH. I think the that's... Four. heard about the yeah. four. I think that's where it's coming from, yeah. Yeah. Is that right, folks? Do you... The, the RL in parallel with the RTH, is that where the four is coming from? R1 over R2. That's probably what it is, because of the yeah, same so. value. You would have mm -hmm. a square on the top and the sum on the bottom. Yeah, that's probably what it is. I didn't mean to back us up, Ken. I just when you oh no no that, no, no. four there. Not wait a minute. What's that four doing there? And that but that makes that's yeah. probably what it is. Yeah, parallel combo of those. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we're squaring up here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Any other yeah. questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. I'm trying, but my head's not working right. I've lost John's audio. Yeah, I don't. It looks like he's on mute. John Austin? John Austin. There you go. Can you hear me off mute? I'm not going to hear you. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, you're a little muffled. <laughs> Can you get near your mic? Yeah. Yeah, I, I see your mic is not. It seems like maybe we're getting noise. Yeah, there's nothing going on. I'll just, I'll hold my question for you. I'm going to be out there and I was just trying to. Um, yeah, John, if you want to put it in that window or send it by email, I can convey it to the, you can comment or question, whichever you want. I'd say just go ahead, Ken. If he's, I think he's, I think John's gonna. Okay. Got it. He's he's okay. He's got what he needed. Okay. Okay. I've got another seven an example. We'll take a look at. And here is my original circuit. And we're gonna sevenize this. We've got twenty volt source. 5 ohms, 5 ohms, 5 ohms here. So we got a little series parallel network. Here's RL. Don't know what it is. And what we're going to do is I'm going to make the 7 equivalent circuit 
So I'm going to isolate R out. Here's my 7 ohm equivalent circuit, which is just a 7 ohm voltage source and a series 7 ohm resistance. Now we've got to figure out what the values are. Okay. When I open this up, what I want to know is what is the voltage across the open here. Okay. When we open that, this 5 ohm resistor here, that's just a tongue hanging out there. It's not in the loop. There's no current pull through that resistor. There can be no voltage drop across it either. So therefore, we don't consider that one in our calculation. So now we have a simple voltage divider. 5 ohms here, 5 ohms here. So the voltage is going to divide evenly. So from here to here, that voltage would be half of this one. So my open circuit voltage, which is the 7 voltage, would be 20 volts by the 2, or 10 volts. Now, the next step is to short the power supply. When we short the power supply, in other words, it's the same idea as just taking the power supply out and closing that with a piece of wire. Okay, now, with respect to out here, what is my total resistance? I've got 5 ohm in parallel with 5 ohm in series, those two together in series with 5 ohm. Because this resistor here is now tied with this one. That puts this one and this one in parallel. 5 in parallel with 5 would be 2.5. In series with this 5 is now 7.5 ohm. Okay. So my 7 and, uh, equivalent resistance is 7 and a half ohms. So up here my equivalent circuit, this would be 7 and a half ohms here, and this would be 10 volts. And then I can put my resistance back on there. Now, in order for maximum power to be delivered to the load, that load would need to be 7 and a half ohms. And then the maximum power that that load could receive using the max power transfer theorem. Take my 7 and voltage of 10 volts squared divided by 4 times 7 and a half ohms. I come up with about 3.33 watts. Any questions on this one? Everybody's quiet out there. Okay, this next slide is a lab that I actually have students do. We first set up a simple um, series parallel network. We got a 15 volt source. We got uh, 1K in parallel 1K in parallel 470 ohm, and then all that in series with 1K. And then they're going to set up the 7 and equivalent circuit. Well, how did I get this out of this circuit up here? Okay. Well, R4, the 470, we're going to call that our load. So we're going to take that out of there. That's our load that we're taking out. So I've got an open circuit, and I want to know what the voltage is here. Well, that'd be the same as the voltage here, which is the same as the voltage here. Okay, so I've got 15 volts. I've got 1K. Now, how much resistance do I have here? Remember, this one's no longer in the circuit, so you've got 1K in parallel 1K, that's a half K. So there is my 
circuit that we're looking at. And I want to know what the voltage is across here. Well, if I look at a series loop here, I got 15 volts divided by 1.5k, that's 10 milliamps. And then I can find the voltage is equal to the 10 milliamps times the 0.5k, 5 volts. I have 5 volts here. Obviously, we have 10 up here. So if I've got 5 volts here, means I've got 5 volts here, means I've got 5 volts right here across that loop. So that is my open circuit voltage of 5 volts, which is actually my 7 equivalent voltage. That's where the 5 volts come from. Now let's find the 7 equivalent resistance. Okay. Now, in order to do that, we have to short this supply. So this just becomes a piece of wire. That seems this R1 is now in parallel with R2, which is in parallel with R3. 1K, in parallel with 1K, in parallel with 1K, would be 0.33K. Okay. And that's my 7 resistance. Well, obviously, I'm using standard value resistors in the lab, so that's as close as we can get, but it's, it's going to be well within tolerance. And then I can strap the load back on there, which was that 470 that I took off. Okay. Now, looking at for max power to occur, then this uh, the 7 in resistance of uh, 333 ohms, this load resistor would have to be 333 ohms. Well, it's not in this case, so we're not going to get maximum power delivered to that load. But uh, in order to get maximum power, that's the value it would need to be, and here's how you calculate how much power that would be. So let's go back to the lab. What I have them do is we're going to calculate the current and voltage for R4 here, and then we're going to do the same thing up here. And then after we calculate it, then we're going to measure it. Okay, so in this lower circuit, our total resistance would be a simple series circuit, 330 plus 470, is 0.8K. And if I take 5 volts divided by 0.8K, that's a little over 6 million, about 6.25 million. And G4, if I take 6.25 million amps times the 0.47K, gives me about 3 volts. So we're looking roughly 3 volts and 6.25 million. Okay, now let's go back up to this circuit. Okay, let's find our total resistance. Okay. Start off here, we've got 1k in parallel with a half a k. That would be 0.5 divided by 1.5. That's 0.333k to that point. And then that is in parallel with another 1k. And then finally we add the 1k here. When I come up with my total resistance, I come up with 1.25k. Two at a time, then add the other one, then add that one. And it doesn't matter what order you take them in. You could say, well, one in parallel with one, that's a half, and parallel with a half, that's a quarter. A quarter plus one is 1.25k. We have. 16 volts, so my source current, or total current right here, would be that source voltage of 16 volts divided by 1.25 K, 12 million. We have 12 million amps up to junction A. And it's going to divide now on over to junction B, which I don't have labeled, but that's what it would be. So let's take a look at junction A. Using the current divider rule, junction A, you got 12 milliamps coming in, you got 1K here, 
and we got 0.33k going in this direction. That would be the result of those two. So to find the current up here, I would put the 1k, this one down here on top, divided by the two added together, 1.33k, multiplied by the 12 milliamps coming in. That gives me 9 milliamps. So now I've got 9 milliamps coming out to here. At junction B, 9 milliamps coming in, 1k this way, half a k over here. I'm more interested in this one up here. So I would put the 1k on top, divided by the two added together, 1.5k, times the 9 milliamps coming in, 6 milliamps going right through here. So we got 6 milliamps. How much current did we have when we figured down here? Just a little bit above 6 milliamps. Okay. Okay, 6.25 milliamps. When I figure yeah, 6.25 milliamps. And again, we've got rounded figures all the way through here, so that's probably a slight discrepancy. Now let's look at the voltage. Okay, I can find the voltage for R4. We've got right here, we know the current here is 12 million amps, and I've got 1K. So that means I have 12 volts here. That would be equal to the current times the resistance. So I'm dropping 12 volts here. I start with 15 volts, drop 12 here. That means I've got a balance of 3 volts across here. And since that's in parallel, that also be 3 volts. And since that's in parallel, that would also be 3 volts. So 3 volts and approximately 6 milliamps. Same thing we had before. So what we're doing is we're proving that this is analytically an equivalent circuit of what we have up here. So, and again, the purpose of evidence theorem is to reduce a series parallel network into a simple series network. And at the same time, if you work it in conjunction with uh, the maximum power transfer theorem, then we know what size load that we need in order to get maximum power delivered to it, as well as we can determine how much that maximum power would be. And so I have We've now calculated our current through and voltage across R4 in both cases, and then I have to measure that to prove that it is an equivalent circuit. Any questions? I have found in the past that most of the students coming from the career tech centers, uh, once we hit mesh analysis of the evidence theorem or maximum power transfer theorem, that becomes new material to them. Most of them have, uh, a lot of them have never even heard of it, and what few that have, uh, uh, most of the time don't really have much of a grasp of it. So this is an area that uh, I feel that uh, we really need to beef up a little bit in order to have an equivalent uh, course for the DC. Okay, any other questions or comments? You guys are being awful quiet tonight. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, Ken, so. Okay. Usually it takes a little bit longer to get through Mesh and seven and 
I guess always there's this mix of, you know, how much does one cover these concepts, um, you know, in a two-year program or in a career center. Obviously, in a career center, you're teaching a college course if one CTEC credit. Um, right. I know that when we get into the bachelor's program and you guys, you guys at Shawnee, obviously many of your students continue into our bachelor's at Miami. Um, mm -hmm controls courses, the, the mesh and nodal analysis is used extensively in the controls course. In right. fact, it's a common problem that the faculty, you know, mention that the students tend to forget it and, you know, they have to go back and so they have handouts right. on mesh and nodal analysis techniques and things like that. And, but mm -hmm. by that time, the students are really good learners. They've had a really strong math background, so probably seeing it again in handout form or a brief lecture, they really grasp it. So. That's one of the problems that we have uh, with the articulation that, that we have our two-year graduates going on for the, for the four year. They're getting this in the first year of their two-year program. Yeah. And, and by the time they get into the controls where they're really using this, uh, which would be their third year, you know, it's starting to get old to them because you know, they they went through this, uh, it's been over a year for them. It's been almost two years. Got it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we do teach uh, some of the uh, beginning controls courses in the second year, and we're, we're applying a little bit of this, but not near as much as what uh, you guys are on the uh, bachelor's level. Right. And that's an even bigger concern I have with, uh, the career tech centers, because uh, they're going to have it uh, uh, probably their senior year, maybe even their junior year, and then they're going to transfer to, say, an associate degree, and they'll have it again in their first year, and then if they go on for a bachelor's year, they're going to skip a year and then have it again, but hopefully that many times around that it, it sinks in and stays. Mm -hmm. But but we may still be faced with having to do a little bit of refresher. And it's just like anything else. I mean, Ohm's Law and the laws of series and parallel and, and so forth, they're using that in everything else that they do. So you know, they're using it. They, they, they don't lose it. But with mesh analysis and evidence there, max, max power transfer, it, it is a uh, very important area but it's an area that uh, it, it's used extensively in, in controls and uh, uh, automation type uh, circuits. And if that's not the area that they're in at the time, they do tend to forget it. Yeah. Okay, on Thursday, my plan is to get into capacitance and uh, in a little bit of inductance. And then next Tuesday, which would finish us up, we will finish with inductance and get into uh, magnetism, magnetics. And then that pretty well summarizes the DC course. But keep in mind, you know, we're, we're covering these, and I'm just using one or two examples of each topic, but yet within the actual college credited course, uh, we're spending several weeks uh, in that. Uh, what I'm trying to show everybody here in, in 10 hours, it's going to take us 75 hours uh, at the college level to go through all of this. So there's a lot more depth, but uh, I, and that's one of the reasons I've been trying to pull some of these uh, questions from exams and so forth gives you some idea of the depth and um, how much rigor that we are trying to put into uh, the course. Hey, Ken, so when you, when you actually run the course, um, this is a semester-long course, so it meets for 15 weeks, let's just say. Right. Uh 
Uh-huh. And you meet how many hours per week? Uh, five. Five hours a week. I assume, what, two of them are lecture, three of them are lab? Right. Okay. And that, so that you, does not count exam times. Exam times is on top of that. Right. Do you do well, you do – I mean, you may have answered this. I had to step away for a moment. I had my phone but wasn't completely connected. Um, do, do you do a lab every week, or do some labs take a couple of weeks, or how does that work? Uh, most of the labs they can complete in one week. Um, so basically they do a lab each week based off of whatever the uh, uh, lecture material was for the week. Okay. Now do, you, do you have lab material? Uh, a lab book, or do you hand out the lab in advance of the lab so they can look it over, or, or how's that how's that work? That is the lab assignment. Uh, some of the labs, well, like I showed tonight a couple of the sheets that I actually give out, and they follow through the lab. Uh, but um, most of the time, I just put a circuit up on the board, and uh, we go through and analyze that. So actually, it is a little bit of lecture at the beginning, and I have them feed the information back to me, you know, uh, as far as numbers and so forth. So it's, they're generating their numbers and we're doing the calculation part. And then they actually set it up in the lab and do the measurement of it. Yeah. And wow. then I have them do a, um, it's not a very elaborate lab report, but they do have to show their results and what those results mean. In other words, if we're talking about the laws of a series circuit, for example, in the series circuit lab, I have them set up a series circuit, and they have to measure the total resistance. Well, first they show how they calculated it, and they measured it and got that value, and then I have them tell me, okay, this proves the law about uh, series resistance, that it's the sum of the individual resistances. And then uh, as far as current, they have to measure the current around the loop, and I have them move that ammeter four or five different places around the loop, and thus showing that it's the same everywhere around the loop. So I have them express back to me that they, you know, they're applying what they picked up from the lab to what the lecture material is, to what the rule or law or whatever it is that we're talking about is. Mm -hmm. The, um, by the way, for those of, for everybody on the chat window, I posted links to that Tina circuit simulation software. Um, again, whether or not it's still valid or whatever, I mean, it came right up when I when I searched it, and mm -hmm. uh, it looked like it was free download. I also posted a how to use Excel to solve determinants, a very simple process, and that link gives you very good examples. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about that, you know, when Ken showed the matrix functions there and the determinants, uh, you, you could you could literally build that in Excel very easily, and the answer would come out. Mm -hmm. But obviously, setting up the problem is is a big key too. Yeah, yeah. The the key to doing mesh analysis is being able to write the loop equations, and once you get that done, then it's just a matter of math. Yeah. Or you're at the end, Ken, are you? Yeah, I'm I, I'm actually at the end of what I had prepared for tonight. <laughs>